Okay, welcome. Again, as if you haven't been welcomed already, um, I'm glad some of my work was already in, in John's talk. Uh, I too think, though, that we need to start with a fun place in digital media. Uh, so let's, let's start with BuzzFeed. This was a BuzzFeed quiz for a Midwest. And if you're not familiar with BuzzFeed, your kids are, and your, your students certainly are as well. Uh, it's a kind of a hipster, um, uh, all-purpose kind of site. Ah, darn it. There's a scroll down. Okay, there we go. And it did a quiz a little while ago uh, based on how Midwestern are you? And we've I don't want to try to scroll back up. I just screw up. Uh, in the Midwest, everyone listens to Taylor Swift, so this goes back to our country thing. But she's from Tennessee. Uh, Kenny Chesney. The other one there is a Wendy's. We got cows. We got cherry flavored beer. Uh, down below, we have some uh, anti LeBron James stuff, Cedar Point. And this goes on and on for quite a while, up and down the page. Pro Football Hall of Fame, the Big Game, uh, the Big Ten. Of course, we have Eminem. Uh, Arby's, and then the one in the middle here, of course, all these farms. Uh, it took me a while to figure out why KISS was there. Any ideas? Detroit Rock City, there we go. Cheeseheads, no idea about Mark Ruffalo um, or Dave Grohl down below there as well. But the idea here, and this is where I wanted to start uh, my talk, is, is really I'm reinforcing uh, the same imagery uh, that John was talking about. Oh, and that is that while there are a few exceptions here, the, the Midwestern norm represented on the slides you showed here on BuzzFeed, uh, here's mostly white, bucolic, agrarian, and unsophisticated. In this and so many other ways, Midwestern identity uh, is still defined and dictated in other places and strictly as an adjunct to those places, measuring the sophistication of a, of a dynamic non-Midwestern place against a static Midwest. And by doing so, this popular website, like so much in the digital public sphere and in traditional media, affirms the region's provincial moribund marginality, perpetuating the infantilizing inferiority complex that characterizes so much of Midwestern culture. Uh, the, uh, the hipster editors of BuzzFeed are not the final arbiters of trans-regional identity, so I'm going to tell a story because that's where literature starts. In 1980, my brother left Champaign, Illinois to go to Dartmouth. After a month, he called me and asked me to drive out to the countryside find a feed store and buy him some farmer's hats. So this is, uh, I need to click down to uh, my slides here. Here we go. I got it. Oh, that's okay. I can just click on it. Thanks. Farming hats. So these are hats that you've all seen. Baseball hats with feed store companies. Uh, why, why did he do this? Um, so my brother uh, had never even planted a row of backyard veggies or driven a tractor. I think he's recently figured out how to work a screwdriver. He's just that type of guy. So why? Because in everybody in Hanover, New Hampshire, that cosmopolitan capital, assumed that everyone in Champaign, Illinois, was a farmer. And tired of refuting this assumption after just two months, he just decided to play the rube letting Ivy Leaguers wallow in their provincial ignorance, safe in the belief that their cosmopolitanism was only affirmed by every Midwesterner's lack thereof. Even though my brother later infiltrated Ivy League culture to the point of joining a secret society, today he lives two blocks from where we grew up back on the Silicon Prairie. Now, both the BuzzFeed materials and my brother's story affirm three archaic stereotypes that cripple genuine self-examination necessary for regional culture and scholarship. So one, these are my starting points. Uh, the agrarian Midwest was largely untouched by the massive globalization of the 20th century and remains, to use some more popular song lyrics, the same small town in each of us, for Don Henley, who's actually from Texas, uh, in which everything's the same back in my little town, uh, from Paul Simon. You know, there's, these are people, baby boomers, looking back and saying, well, there is still this stable place in American culture. It's not here, it's, it's there. Um, next, then, is contact between the Midwest and the outer world passes exclusively through the more globalized parts of the nation, i.e., the coasts. 
As flyover country, its image is mediated exclusively by the arbiters of cultures and the manufacturers of media. Number three, last, other regions are not going to change their minds about the Midwest. They need, to, they need it as a national straw man, and ironically, this could liberate us uh, to stop worrying about trying to impress the coasts, because we do get nervous about that, and instead look inward to explore what we are rather than what the nation needs us to be. In other words, images or narratives of the Midwest diverging from the bucolic, or its equally enclosed obverse, the dying rust belt, kind of binary, uh, don't get shown in the national media. Midwesterners on television and in movies are white and rural. This image gets used. Uh, I remember seeing Axel Rose uh, from Lafayette, Indiana, stepping off a bus on the Hollywood Boulevard with a blade of grass in his mouth at the start of the Welcome to the Jungle video, if you remember that from 25 years ago. <laughs> uh, or the region is just invisible as are most colonial or peripheral locales. Cities you'll never see on screen, on screen, says the New Zealander Lord, a uh, favorite of my sons. Uh, second visibility silences the local by labeling at it as provincial or, or colonial, fit only for cultural subordination or anachronism, and cultural second class citizenship. Oddly enough, expatriate Midwesterners are often most responsible for the persistence of these images. Midwesterners still revolt from the village and believe that rejecting the Midwest actualizes their own cosmopolitanism, such as Axel Rose, or as I'll suggest, William Dean Howells, or F. Scott Fitzgerald. For these expats and their coastal audiences and compadres, the nation has a singular culture, and that it begins and ends in New York with branch offices in Los Angeles. Now, several times before, Midwesterners have tried to shape the subordination and explore regional difference. Hamlin Garland and the populists in the 1930s, Grant Wood, and the Midwestern radicals come to mind, according to Richard Dornan. However, each fell before subsequent waves of nationalism, uh, often linked to wars requiring a patriotic marshalling of regional resources before coming to fruition. The question then this evening is, can the current paradigm of the global offer a better perspective for regional cultures in, in general and for Midwestern culture in specific to undo the perpetuation of this imagery. Might it help us to explore our region unencumbered by the burden of an assigned role in the nation-based master narrative to enter the global community as something more than a component of the nation? So, from my academic perspective as literary historian, is the new paradigm, the global Midwest, both applicable and will it serve the development of more local and regional forms of literary and cultural production? When I was contacted about this event, the idea of the global Midwest, as, as, as John suggested as well, seemed oxymoronic. Nonetheless, I began to see the interaction of these words as a generative stuff, the local manifestations of globalization, of cultural production, distribution, and consumption, as a component of the globalization of the world's economy more generally. It allows a reimagining of the Midwest that might both account for the region's diversity and global entanglements and initiate new collaborative methods of evaluation and analysis based on the local condition of, of cultural production. The good thing is, and I think this is where you know, John's been right, our writers have been doing this. I'm speaking about it from a more literary perspective, obviously. Writers and a lot of our cultural producers have already been doing this. The bad news is the academy is often looking the other way. And this is how it's worked in Midwestern literary studies. In 1993, Ronald Weber's The Midwestern Ascendance in American Literature brilliantly traces out the rise of writers born in the Midwest from regional obscurity to national and international promises, prominence, eclipsing those from other American regions between 1870 and 1940. To Weber, this began with the Ohio editor uh, William Dean Howells' move from Cincinnati to Boston and then to New York and led up through Mark Twain, Theodore Dreiser, Willard Cather, Sherwood Anderson, Harriet Monroe, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Booth Tarkington, and Ernest Hemingway, among many others. If you think about early, Ameri early 20th century American literature, you think about Midwestern writers to a large degree, T.S. Eliot. However, for Weber, the important narrative is embedded in his title. Midwestern writing is a component, a subcategory in his project of American writing. Most of the writers he addresses left the Midwest uh, their, their Midwestern homes, usually first for Chicago, but then they left pretty quickly again 
uh, for Boston or New York, or then later London and Paris. Being published in those places then was the sign of success for a regional writer. Moreover, these writers achieved their success by recycling the old Arcadian myth of the Midwest as innocent and bucolic. This image persisted even as the region became heavily industrialized and as farming faced serious losses in the 1890s and during the interwar years. In other words, these writers were more concerned with writing American literature set in the Midwest than they were with creating a Midwestern literature, one unconcerned with meeting the expectations of elsewhere. As such, the Midwestern image acceptable to the nation a century ago reflected what geographer James Shortridge, uh, John mentioned Shortridge, his book, The Middle West, Its Meaning in American Culture, again, 25 years old. Uh, but he identifies this as a colonial status. He writes, the dominant viewpoint reflected in the, the continual attraction of Americans toward urban places and an associated constellation of materialism, obsession with new technology, and change for the sake of change. The eastern and western seaboards profited from this mindset. The Middle West, still firmly identified with rural themes, did not. From this perspective, the Midwest has become a museum of sorts. No up and coming citizen wanted to live there, but it had important as a repository for traditional values. So as a cathartic colony then, the Midwest was doomed to the periphery, and many of its best writers gladly affirmed that image or its dystopic opposite the horrific backwater, either way more spectacle than subject in exchange for a place in the American and international literary scene. For example, when, Hem when, Hem sorry, when Hemingway writes about the Midwest, he revels in the bucolic imagery of northern Michigan, which by the way, the UP wasn't, on, wasn't yellow on one of your maps of the Midwest. I like the UP, but I'm not sure it's part of the Midwest. <laughs> um, anyway, Hemingway wrote about northern Michigan, not of the complexity of the suburban Oak Park neighborhood where he spent more time. In acceding to the image of the Midwest as a museum, Hemingway wrote American literature, not Midwestern literature, regional but not regionalist. When divergence from this image was voiced by figures such as uh, William Davis Gallagher, William Cogshaw, Edgar Lee Masters, or Ed, Ed, Edward Ward Howe, well, there's, there's a reason you haven't heard of them. And that's just among the publishing white male writers. Because traditional literary history demands a national or a universal scale, pursuing a theory or practice for region-based literary scholarship has long been a professional dead end in academia, save for the South and its lost cause, all those professors uh, down South, um, which is really a covert nationalism, I think, more than a regionalism. Conventional academic methods only lead back to defining the region as perif periphery and as colony. Regions are subnational places whose writing and culture must pass through the metropolitan centers to meet their standards of meaning. That is, if we use New York or Harvard's methods for reading Midwestern texts, or Paris's or Frankfurt's theories, we will reiterate the same old hierarchies and exclusions. Even the many texts written by Midwesterners that be bemoan the moral and artistic depravity of the metropolis only end up reaffirming it as the only meaningful point of reference. For example, even as Missourian T.S. Eliot identified London as the wasteland, he still found it on the cutting edge of history. Experience a decline that will only later spread to less significant locales. Likewise, in the 1990s, Deleuzian uh, critical regionalism's conversion of freeholding farmers and writers like uh, Hamlin Garland uh, to noble proletarians uh, in the work of, say, Philip Fisher or Cheryl Temple Hur, likewise defines the local as meaningful only when it opposes diametrically the national. Such counter narratives reaffirm uh, on the, both the critical and the creative levels the hierarchy of the older vertical model of, trans, of the transatlantic north as a global center simply being counter with all the other regions around the world stacked in descending order representing humanity's progress and meaning or lack thereof, a narrative bolstered by traditionally disciplinary boundaries and implicitly a racial stratification disguised as geographic uh, preference. Okay, can we learn to do more than resist the east looking upward lurking, looking gaze, uh, transatlantic or transappalachian? Can we learn to ignore their condescension? Can the paradigm of the local help us do that? This is where the, the Humanities Without Wall projects, I think, really offers an opening for rethinking regional culture in the context of the 21st century's global community of cultures. 
Let's begin with a quick and dirty provisional thesis. By transcending the epistemology of the vertical, the global offers an intrinsically horizontal means of thinking about cultural production, distribution, consumption, scholarship, and pedagogy. Here I'm borrowing the paradigm of the global from other globalized aspects of our economies. Think of it this way. First, other regional industries have long operated with a, a matrix of global simultaneities. For example, to the west of my home in the middle of Michigan's mitten, right, if you're from Michigan, that's what you do, uh, the consumption of Amway products by the growing middle classes of Eastern Asia and the former Soviet bloc assure that the Van Andel and DeVos families of Grand Rapids, who own Amway, will maintain a stranglehold on Western Michigan politics. It's a global thing. It doesn't pass through New York. It doesn't do the things that regional things are supposed to do. Lower in the Midwest, and I remember the story from this summer where the, where the soil is darker, uh, beef produced in factory farms in Illinois was tainted in the process of being processed in Asia, and it virtually shut down Chicago-based McDonald's restaurants throughout China. Got that? That's, that's pretty global, right? We've got a lot of things going on there. The shift toward the global and international business has revolutionized economics, catalyzing new paradigms based on the non-hierarchical principles of globalization, de-emphasizing the role of New York in the movement and exchange of international goods and services. So let's move to another globalized industry closer to home and closer to the humanities, the, de pardon me, the decentralization of cultural production and consumption brought on by digital media. Witness a 600% shrinkage in recording industry revenues, the closing of chain record stores and bookstores that never had more than one shelf for local bands or writers. Uh, and this has likewise, to a degree, removed Los Angeles and New York from the center of those industries. But it's not just about where business is being done. This transition has altered cultural production beyond the industry's economic decentralization. Without MBAs with spreadsheets calling the shots from their offices in New York or Los Angeles, different and mixed genres have thrived. And you can search them and find them without having to go to the record store and dig your way through Aerosmith and all this sort of thing. It's, it's all right there. Um, the transition to the global horizontal period of music has changed not only the how and the where, but also the what. While today's musicians might not get rich, the do-it-yourself of, la of, of your laptop, on your laptop atmosphere has generated tremendous local experimentation among 21st century musicians. After this group, Sufjan Stevens, Connor O'Burst support themselves as Midwestern musicians without having the answer not. to Hollywood. Now, how might this translate to literary studies and local literary production? One important way might be to consider, reconsider the longstanding paradigm of the artist and the scholar as individuals working alone, thus considering the other conference theme, collaboration. The old Emersonian isolato model uh, was developed to express the need for self-reliance at the core of American exceptionalism, a rhetoric developed for and by comfortable white men in New England. These are components of, in the academy, a national narrative a literature of individuality bolstered by, bolstered by a culture of individuality. However, the isolationist model also reflected earlier modes of print technology and editorial gatekeeping through the publishing centers. By contrast, today, the web has decentered the process. Local authors are likely to, to post drafted chapters among their social media contacts, trying out new forms of collaborative and collective authorships. Moreover, by e-publishing directly, they often avoid the publication costs traditionally underwritten through New York. Likewise, the drop in printing costs brought about by digital technologies has granted local publishers and authors previously unheard of access to readers and markets that used to depend on the centralized publicity and distribution industries. Uh, finally, once big stores like Borders dominated the trade, today, Borders, the old Borders that used to be just over here is a closed store. Okay, free then from so much reliance upon New York or Los Angeles to have Midwestern cultural producers, or at least those interested in doing so, have they been able to explore and articulate a distinct regionalist self-expression? Moreover, do locally produced texts and other cultural artifacts do more than just embrace or reject the image of the Midwest as a nation's museum? Have they always been there, or just have they been undervalued? Finally, has a regionally distinctive and appropriate means of studying local productions, both past and present, come into being? That is, 
are and have non-reactionary play-specific texts always been written in the Midwest, only to vanish for their unmarketable insistence on place-based subjectivities. Um, in the version of the paper, then, I prepared, I do a quick reading of The Great Gatsby. We're running a little late, so I think I'll skip that. But what I basically say is Gatsby is a text written by a Midwestern writer that's very much a colonial text, and you can line it up with how other second world, well, that is white diasporic writers, love to tell stories about traveling back to London. In his case, it's just New York. He finds that the center does not hold, and he returns to a very bucolic, that is Nick Carraway does, his, um, his father's Wisconsin at the end of the novel. There's that famous scene. I'll just read it really quick. That's my little weft, not the wheat or the prairies or the loft Swede towns, but the thrilling return of train of my youth and the street lamps and sleigh bells in the frosty dark and the shadows of holly wreaths thrown by lighted windows on the snow. This is the image of the Midwest as the museum that the East needs. Gatsby doesn't have the same meaning if New York and Wisconsin have the same level or equal levels of sophistication or cosmopolitanism, right? They need home as opposed to uh, the sophisticated place. Um, all right. Nick's perspective, mirroring Fitzgerald's own, I finish by saying, as his narrator, is limited by blinders of race, class, and gender. His Midwest is as white as the snow and as comfortable as the Pullman car carrying him home to a family home with his name on it. Okay, I want to, I'm done with that section though. By contrast, I want to tell, uh, I want to think about other writers and what I've been doing. However, even a century ago, Midwestern writers were offering more diverse perspectives and getting off the less comfortable parts of that train in less comfortable parts of town to tell more genuinely Midwestern stories. Starting with Carolyn Kirkland, though herself a New York speculator, in 1838, Midwestern writers have revealed far more complex regional realities running through Hamlin Garland, Joseph Kirkland, O.E. Rovat, Theodore Dreiser, Sinclair Lewis, Carl Sandburg, Jack Conroy, and dozens of writers through the Depression and after. The complexity of Midwestern whiteness has been explored for its non-bucolic aspects. Moreover, beginning with voices from uh, Potawatomi writer Simon Pokagon and up through Toni Morrison from Lorain, Ohio, remember, Louise Erdrich, Varadi Mukherjee, Sandra Cisneros, etc., the Midwest's racial complexity has been expressed and lamented. But we often don't think of racial writers as also being regional writers, but they're writing about very specific places and we need to bring them into our conversations. In the past few years, I've been working on ways of bringing these alternative Midwests to the classroom and to the community. How, when, when I started, though, the concept of the Midwest seemed just a little bit too big. I've worked on it a lot before, but I want to do something closer to home. I've been, uh, I've been living and teaching in, the, in Michigan for more than two decades. Plus, although I went to school in Champaign, my family spent summers on my father's family's long-held land in western Michigan. And after I cleared the institutional hurdles at MSU, always an issue, right, uh, promotion and tenure, et cetera, I uh, decided to cast down my bucket where I was. First, I read voraciously in Michigan literature and history. I found dozens of well-written books that told a history, unavailable in national or other extra-local sources. Ron Ricci taught me about working class life in the UP. Jim Daniels about the margins of Detroit. Terry McMillan, you don't think of her as a Michigan writer, but she's from Port Huron. And Gloria Naylor taught me about its racial history. And Michigan uh, mystery writers like Lauren Esselman, Joseph Haywood, Brian Gruley, Elizabeth Buzelli weave their thrillers around local legends and topography. Michigan-born national figures like Joyce Carol Oates, Jeffrey Eugenides, Jim Harrison, and Elmore Leonard helped. But writers working under the radar without agents in New York uh, somehow felt more local. So I began to teach a section of Midwestern culture and MSU, I'm sorry, Michigan culture and MSU's Integrated Studies in the Arts and Humanities program. Now, these are the classes of 300 students uh, with an army of TAs, but all students are required to take eight credit hours in IAH, so you have kind of a captive audience, and that helps. Part of my planning dovetailed with my college's efforts to expand our outreach activities. I wanted to bring in the writers to talk to my students but I wanted, they had to be off campus for them to be outreach events. Moreover, the same old readings, you know, authors coming to do readings, performance format would not do. It replicates the detachment of the author from the community as required in traditional scholarship. The regionalist writer must be a part of, not a part from, the community. The texts I was teaching were all invested, not just in Michigan, but in problems facing Michigan. And while I could decode the stories, 
as literary artifacts, the interconnection of literature and lived experience in the stories needed more exposition and explication. I applied for and got an internal grant for some off-campus events, and so I required attendance at these to make sure I had a good audience, but I didn't need to. Um, they had become the one of the three events we did. And I started lining up not only authors, but also other people in the field. So let me give you an example. First, I wanted to teach National Book Award uh, semi-finalist in Comstock Mule Farmer, really. Uh, Bonnie Jo Campbell's American Salvage. Do any of you know Bonnie's book? Highly recommend it. Uh, her stories describe crystal meth use in Michigan, among other things. How to help students think about all aspects and implications of this issue. And here's where collaboration came in. I decided to bring in other experts, academic and non-academic, assign them all one story to read, and ask them to discuss it from their perspective. We held the event off campus and did publicity on community radio and alternative papers, things like that. The evening began with a student-made film of the story in question, and then Bonnie spoke, and she just talked about, she waved her feet, she was so excited about this, just about what she was doing with the story. She didn't read it, she didn't need to, we had the film. Next, my colleague, Steve Rackman, discussed the history of the literature of addiction. It's a long story. Third, a pharmacologist. You're thinking, this is literature? We have a pharmacologist come in. Do you even know what a pharmacologist is? Uh, these are not pharmacists. My wife's a pharmacologist. They do drug research. They really discover how the systems work. Uh, so Jim Galligan uh, described the neurobiology of meth. And he brought in all these slides of these brain slices. And it was literally like, here is your brain on meth. It was wonderful. Uh, now, <laughs> fourth, and here's where we left campus, literally, I suppose, uh, Lieutenant Tony Salcedo, head of the Michigan State Police Task, or Methamphetamine Task Force, affirmed the story's conditions, and boy, did he have other stories to tell. And finally, Joyce Pines, a Kalamazoo-based uh, addictions counselor, responded. A writer, a professor, a scientist, a cop, and a therapist. The following conversation, I, I first told them to kind of respond to each other. And we'd, we'd still be going, this is two years later, I think, if we didn't say, all right, you have to stop and, and bring in the rest of the audience. They had so much to say to each other because each was an expert working in the field, but within his or her own silo, right? And so this process was building the kind of rhizomatic network that really is what Bonnie was working from, even if she didn't know it as she was writing these stories. And look, most of the students in this humanities class, this is required of all undergraduates. These are not English majors, OK? And they're going to be you know, pharmacology majors. They're going to be people who want to go interested in counseling and things like that. This made the story come to life for them in ways that I couldn't do simply as a literary explicator. OK? All right, uh, we got a grant to do three of these. Oh, and then, by the way, we had about 100 people per event, a little more at the second event, show up from the community as well. They got up and told stories and thought about it as well. Uh, it was a great piece of outreach. Okay, a month later, we did the same thing with Alita Hernandez, another writer you haven't heard about, author of Autopsy of an Engine, uh, a Trinidadian Hispanophone. She came to Michigan, worked 30 years in the Cadillac factory, uh, got an MFA, and now she teaches uh, creative writing at, at, at U of M. I put her on stage with a professor of Chicana Studies, an industrial relations prof, the local union president, that was fun, and best of all, a spokesman for GM, poor guy. Uh, we had this event too at a UAW union hall next to what used to be in the shadow of the GM plant. But if you know Lansing at all, there is no GM plant there anymore. So it's just this expanse of toxic concrete uh, as we looked off to the west. Uh, but we were in the union hall for this. Um, sparks flew. Uh, we did another one that spring then on invasive species. This spring we got some money to do another one. We did factory farming in the essays of Janet Kaufman. We brought in um, sociologists, farmers, um, people who talk about factory farmers. I got someone from the Michigan Meat Association. I thought this is great, somebody pro meat. They were all about, you know, sustainability and such, you know, so that was nice, but it wasn't quite the same. Okay, needless to say, the student papers generated after these events were not your standard literary interpretations. These events helped them understand what was going on in their own communities and how literature could be found all around them. Moreover, the Michigan in these texts is far from the static utopia or dystopia of the Rust Belt portrayed in the national media or in hipster-based ruin porn sites. 
boy, are, those are fun to teach, though. Uh, Johnny Knoxville does a bunch of kind of anti-ruin porn ones that are really cool. Uh, you can Google them. As Michigan emerges uh, in its post-industrial moment, its writing reveals a globalized condition. Its Hispanophone and Asian populations are ubiquitous, and the working class's southern background, black and white, complicates racial relations in life and in the writings of, of say, Hernandez or Ben Hamper. Distant wars have changed the population, so we often watch Gran Torino. The formerly migrant Latin population is now permanent, as we read in Steve Amick's The Lake, the River, and the Other Lake. Bilge water from Asian ships, zebra mussels, have brought zebra mussels, devastating the fishing industry, as Joseph Haywood's mysteries show us, upset among conservation officers. The global, that is to say, permeates the local, and these books tell the story of that. When teaching in the Michigan writer, though, my favorite moment is when a student recognizes the landscape, because most of our students are in state. He'll say, or, he'll, or she'll say, hey, I know where that gas station is. Really, I've had students say that. This year, well, one, they also often make other references. This year, I'm turning the humanities course into a literature course and plunging more deeply into not only local texts, but let's call it regional ways of reading them to complement the conventional strategies and methods the English majors already know. As English majors, they will recognize, for example, Campbell's gritty realism and wise feminism, and will trace each back through its literary orthodoxies as we've trained them to do. However, the disciplinary boundaries they develop in their core prereq English courses to study produce texts, to study texts produced uh, for other places will get them only so far. They will need local knowledges and interpretive strategies peculiar to their place. If by the end of the semester they can decode Campbell, let's say, using both feminist theory and by recognizing that, you know, where that gas station is, my students will have achieved the intriguing simultaneity of the global and the Midwestern. Um, one more paragraph. Uh, I want to chime in with John this notion that history and these things are all around us, uh, and we need to just think about where they are. So I'm pretty sure the land we're standing on right now, before it was a church, and somebody can get out the plats, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm close, um, was owned by the Kinsey family dating back to the end of the War of 1812. If you want to know more, see Juliet Kinsey's Waw Bun. Her narrative of her life as an Eastern woman brought west by her fur trader husband. You can read about how her, fam her husband's family were disguised as French by the local Métis population to keep them from the marauding Potawatomis during the Fort Dearborn Massacre. Or, you can read the novels about the massacre written by Captain John Richardson, who was an Ottawa Anglo-Canadian novelist, and he wrote these two novels, Hard Scrabble and Wananji, set right here, that end with the Indian hero and his white lover escaping to the French community over in St. Joseph's. Or is that more complicated than Midwestern stories are supposed to be? Thank you. <laughs>